1625, Charles came to the throne. King Charles had a war with Spain, so he needed money. What do you do when you're a broke English king and you need money? You call the parliament. This didn't really go well though. Mostly because they wanted to impeach the king's best friend, the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke of Buckingham basically convinced Charles and everybody else in the royal family that he was a genius in finance, diplomacy, war, and pretty much anything else. Everyone else thought, this is bullcrap, you haven't had that much experience. And everyone else got proved right. When he launched a raid against the Spanish into Cadiz and his men got drunk and couldn't be asked to fight anymore. After a few more disastrous military interventions, the Duke of Buckingham was assassinated. Parliament were overjoyed, and Charles wasn't. He was so annoyed at Parliament that he didn't call them again for another 11 years. One problem though, he was still at war, and Spain didn't really care about this, so they were still trying to deal with some stupid Protestants in the Netherlands. They had more important things to deal with. He still needed money though. As so we decided to do some crazy schemes to get rich quick, he granted monopolies to his friends, though he didn't have a lot, and stole all the money in the London Mint, stole all the East India Company's pepper, along with some other crazy stuff. After getting enough money to sustain himself, he turned to his main gripe, religion. Even though England was Protestant ever since Queen Elizabeth came to the throne, Charles loved the fancy ceremonies and you know who else loved that? The Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord. You know what we should do? Says Charles. Convert Scotland. On Saturday, July 23rd, 1637, the Dean of a Cathedral in Edinburgh started reading from the Book of Common Prayer. The crowd went nuts, throwing books at the nobles, someone threw a chair at the Dean. There were so many riots in Edinburgh that the King's Council in Scotland had to pull out of the area. But who read the next year? The treasurer for Scotland goes. You're not going to win this fight, even with 39,000 men. Charles goes, how about 40,000? Meanwhile in Scotland, the Scottish lords hear about this, and they signed a national covenant swearing to uphold the Scottish version of Protestantism. Charles gathered his men, they got whooped by the Scottish, and Alexander Leslie occupied Newcastle, starving England of coal. The Parliament were angry because they hadn't been summoned for 12 years and most of the MPs had their land seized by Charles to pay for that stupid war with the Scots. However, no one in Parliament actually thought Charles had anything to do with it. It was all to do with his bad ministers leading him astray, most notably the Duke of Strafford. Basically, they wanted to try Strafford for allegedly trying to use the army in Ireland to stop Parliament. He allegedly said to Charles, you have an army in Ireland you may employ to reduce this kingdom. But he meant Scotland. The Parliament wasn't happy because his statements made it obvious that they really couldn't impeach him, they had nothing on him. So they introduced a bill in Parliament, a Bill of Attainder. A Bill of Attainder is one of the most scariest things. A Bill of Attainder basically says that if you manage to pass this bill, you can execute anybody you want. It passed the House of Commons, and had to go to the House of Lords. The House of Lords didn't want to pass it and was debated for a few weeks. Meanwhile, the MPs in the House of Commons went round to their constituents and basically made them really angry and hound for blood. The Lords in the House were really scared. They were so scared that out of 80 that had been present at the trial of Strafford, only 46 were present to vote. And the bill was passed by a vote of 35 to 11. All that was left was for the king to sign it and make it law. Gangs of people showed up at the palace at Whitehall, screaming for justice. The king had to agree. He just he couldn't in his good conscience sign it though. So he had to get his two councillors to sign it because he couldn't bear to have his hands on the whole business. Strafford's response was, Don't put your trust in princes, not in any other man, for in them there is no salvation. After a few months of dealing with a parliament that was too boastful for its own good, gaining power after killing Strafford and wanted to flex muscles, Charles wanted his power back. So he makes a list of popular MPs and plans to charge them with treason. He says to one of his councillors, strike boldly at them, seize the leaders, have them tried and condemned and executed, threaten the rest with the same fate 
and follow up these measures with energetic and decisive action. You will soon make a change in the affairs. He marches into the House of Commons. In January 4th, 1642. I demand John Pym, John Hampden, Arthur Hazelrig, Denzel Halls, and William Strode. They aren't here, sir, says the Speaker. Where have they gone? The Speaker stands up to the King. This is a pivotal moment, because nobody would dare go against the King. May it please your Majesty, I have neither eyes to speak, nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the House is pleased to direct me. Charles said all my birds have flown the coop, and was forced to leave. Parliament was pissed, never in the history of England had a King entered Parliament, not to mention dragging people out by the ear. The urban poor rioted, Charles, fearing for his life, fled to York. Towns began declaring support for Charles or the Parliament, leading to the Civil War. Legally, only the King could raise an army, but Parliament passed an ordinance, not a law technically, so allowing them to raise troops and pay for them without the King's permission. Both sides began to raise troops. Both needed to win the propaganda war. Charles wants to get them to recognise his authority. He needed a way to flex. He needed gunpowder and weapons. He goes to Hull. Charles gets to Hull a few days later. Charles says, open the gates. I can't, sir. I need authorization from the king. You have my permission. No, I mean the sovereign authority of the king, which you gave to parliament. Charles is like, what the fuck? And goes off in a huff. No battles were fought for a while though, as everyone tried to build armies. Parliament raised a load of troops, and Charles didn't, until the Lords did it for him. The King's allies slipped out of Parliament to join him, making a peaceful resolution impossible, and making Parliament more radical. The Earl of Essex marched under the orders of Parliament with an army to find Charles. After the two cavalry forces met at Poet Bridge, the Royalists under Prince Rupert one of the only guys that actually fought a war before engaging in this one, rushed B and didn't stop. After walking towards London, Charles gathered 14,000 men. The two forces met at Edgehill, Prince Rupert using the rush B don't stop method against the parliamentary cavalry, but he didn't stop. He didn't whirl around to destroy the parliamentary infantry. So the parliamentary infantry and the royalist infantry basically fought until nightfall and they had to both stop fighting. Charles ran off to Oxford, just before winter came. By autumn 1643, Royalists controlled the North, wiped out the Parliamentary Army in the North, they needed allies, they needed the Scots. Parliament goes to the Scots and says, we won't mess with your religion, hell we'll make it the official religion of England, hell we've got the troops to enforce it, if you join us in fighting the King. Alexander Leslie the leader of the Scots, crosses the River Tweed with 20,000 men in January 1644. Meanwhile in Parliament, they split. The leader in Parliament, John Pym, the one who wanted to kill the Duke of Buckingham, died, and they devolved into two factions. Those who wanted Charles to agree to peace, now, and the war camp who said, there's no negotiating with him, wait till he's militarily destroyed, and then we can talk about a settlement. By March 1644, a royalist army under the command of a guy named Hopton fought at Cheriton. The parliament won, and hearing that the king's army was in really bad shape, sent two parliamentary armies to bomb rush Charles. Charles sent a letter saying, hey, I'll come, I'll come to negotiate now, and started to head towards London. Then he pranked them and ran all the way to Worcester. Anyways, his armies got beaten badly in Newbury, Windsor, and Marston Moor. After a few more battles and making a professional army under the command of Thomas Fairfax and his subordinate, Oliver Cromwell, Charles finally lost his military capacity at Naseby and escapes Oxford on April 27, 1646. Charles sends a letter saying to the Scots, hey, can we make a deal? Charles shows up to the Scottish camp and gets captured. He thought that, you know, it's better to negotiate with the Scots than the Parliament, especially since John Pym died. The Scots says, we'll make the punishment Parliament wants to give you less severe 
if you allow us freedom of worship. You know the thing we had before you started this whole mess? Charles goes, How about no? It's the only thing we want. No. Are you dumb? No? Alright, we're not going to get much use out of him. Let's hand him over to Parliament for some money. Charles was then taken to one of his estates called Homby House by the Scots while Parliament figured out what the hell to do with him. Parliament was in debt. They tried to disband the army. The army goes, whoa, you are not trying to disband us. We haven't been paid in months. Thomas Fairfax, the leader of the parliamentary army, though he wasn't really involved in this whole revolt, says he doesn't have a point. Parliament tells Fairfax to crush the revolt, separate the armies, then leave. The rank and file are really angry that the Parliament was to sack Fairfax. They all loved Fairfax. So an idea turns around in the parliamentary rank and file's head. Hey, let's kidnap the king. So an army officer called Cornet Joyce gathers a group of men and rides to Humby House and talks to the king in his bedroom. Charles says, I'll go in the morning and don't hurt me and just treat me with respect. When Charles woke up the next morning, seeing a small group of soldiers, Charles turns to Joyce and says, Are you sure you're from Parliament? Come on, we have to go. The reinforcements will be here soon. Are you sure you're from Parliament? Where's your commission to say you can take me? I want proof. Joyce points to the soldiers behind him and says, There's my commission. I've never seen a clearer commission written in my life. Charles tried to escape from his imprisonment after Parliament captured him. Charles was executed. Charles's beheading was scheduled for Tuesday, 30th of January, 1649. 